Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Can I just start by saying a big thank you to Claudio Spinacci and Unioni Petrolifera for inviting me today to make a talk at your General Assembly. It would, of course, be even nicer to be all in a room together and to be able to do this the old fashioned way. But we are in a new world for the time being, and we have to do it like this and we'll make the most of it. Nevertheless, thank you. What I'd like to do today is to share the work that we've done on the Clean Fuels for All pathway that has been jo uh, jointly developed by our industry association with our members and the national associations, including Unione Petrolifera. This is joint work uh, with a substantial technology and economic evaluation behind it, and our stakeholders uh, including Union of Petrolifera, have been very important. And I'd also like to thank um, Claudio and his team for the great job that they've done sharing this work and the messages across the various stakeholders of Italy. Mr. Cooper, le recenti dichiarazioni di Ursula von der Leyen hanno reso ancora più ambiziosi i progetti ambientali dell'Unione Europea, cioè diminuire al 55% le emissioni entro il 2030 per arrivare alla decarbonizzazione del continente nel 2050 e la von der Leyen ha detto che l'industria europea può farcela. Per quanto riguarda l'industria della raffinazione, si è messa, lo sappiamo, sulla strada già nel 2018 con Vision 2050 e adesso con il progetto Clean Fuels for All che è stato presentato lo scorso giugno. Allora la domanda è come si coniugano queste vostre iniziative con gli orientamenti europei destinati a diventare legge? So let me start by saying that we welcome the ambition and vision of the European Union as set out by the European Commission and are supporting the objectives of getting to climate neutrality by 2050 and the associated Green Deal. We have started from a, a position of examining what is possible and what our industry can bring to the table. And we knew from the very beginning that this had to be based on sound technology and economics, and then supported by good policy. In our association, we are so lucky to have the science and technology and economics division organization, CONCAWI, and they have provided all the critical work that is the foundation of Fuels Europe's um, story and pathway now. Konkawi's work we have described as the low carbon pathways work, and it includes a number of different areas. But their work was informed initially by a very thorough evaluation of the Commission's own work known as Clean Planet Fall, published by the Commission in November 2018, setting out a number of different visions or scenarios of what Europe can look like by 2050 and by different means. The critical scenario that is the reference point for our work is the scenario in that document described as the 1.5 degrees tech scenario, which refers to a way of getting to Europe's share of climate neutrality defined as limited with a 1.5 degree C rise in global temperatures and achieved in Europe by a heavy deployment of technology across all kinds of different sectors and the whole economy. There are other scenarios in that work that describe different ways of getting to 1.5 degrees, such as with very substantial lifestyle changes. But the Commission instead has adopted the tech scenario because they believe it's more deliverable. And we would agree. The other scenario that's important in this work of the Commission is what they've described as the 2030 baseline scenario, which describes what's already on the books and will deliver some way to climate neutrality, but not enough. We examined what is the gap and what we can contribute. The other key part of the work that we've used here is the availability in Europe of raw materials that we need to make low carbon liquid fuels. This is biomass, agricultural waste, forestry waste, other industrial wastes. And JRC has really pioneered that work for Europe and their own work has been the basis 
of our evaluation and our build up from the ground up of what we can do year by year out to 2050. So very thorough work, very heavily justified and built on external uh, references to make sure that it's robust. Ci sono già diversi progetti pilota sulla tecnologia dei carburanti liquidi a basso contenuto di carbonio. Che tempi si prevedono per la loro industrializzazione e in che tempi sostituiranno i carburanti di origine fossile? I think it's important to recognize that this pathway that we're describing here is not something that's based on theoretical paper-based projects that may come to fruition one day. In fact, there are 18 projects that we can uh, see already across Europe that are already at industrial pilot stage or full-scale industrialization. It's not all our member companies. One of the strengths of this strategy is that being based on technologies and resources, it's open to a wide range of different companies and paves the way for deep industrial collaboration, creation of industrial clusters, and creating new value chains for wastes, residues, and forms of, uh, of participation in new technologies. There are two very good examples we can point to here in Italy with the conversion of refineries in Venice and in Gela to biorefineries which means, first of all, that the use of petroleum as a feedstock has been phased out completely, replaced by biomass and biogenic material, enabling these refineries to produce liquid fuels, but from completely different sources. One thing I will say is that we do see that the overall demand for liquids will be lower in the future, and that means the quantities that need to be delivered to deliver the Green Deal are lower than the overall consumption of petroleum today. Nevertheless, we can see very significant quantities are possible, enabling liquid fuels to play a key role in delivering the, the Green Deal. We can see from our pathway that something like 30 million tons of low carbon liquid fuels can be possible by 2030. And by 2050, that could rise to 150 million tons, enabling these volumes to play a role in the decarbonization of many different transport sectors. In terms of CO2 savings, by 2035, we can see 100 million tons of CO2 saved uh, through uh, substitution of uh, petroleum with low carbon liquids uh, in, in these different sectors. Now, in terms of uh, visibility of these projects. Of course, it will be quite difficult to get all around Europe and see 18 different projects. You can go to our website, cleanfuelsforall.eu, and you can find there a map with all of these different projects detailed. And so you can do a small tour at your desktop. Cosa serve affinché questo processo, che di per sé è potenzialmente risolutivo, possa avere successo? Il settore dell'automotive è pronto a raccogliere questa sfida? A critical overarching point is that we need to create demand for low carbon liquids, a market that has got a long term wavelength, stable regulation that enables creation of a business case. A key element of that that we see is the reform of the way fuels taxation is done. It's strange today that a liquid fuel is taxed whatever its carbon intensity and is taxed highly whereas electricity and hydrogen, regardless of their carbon history, are taxed at zero. And we think that is not going to give us the, the right uh, outcome. Critical thing is to form the fuels tax into something that feels more like and operates more like a carbon-based taxation system. That's the first point that we're making. Uh, secondly, we need to have some kind of fuels instrument an evolution of the current regulations we have for fuels that include coverage for all of the technologies we've described in our Clean Fuels for All strategy. And again, with a long-term trajectory, uh, with an ambitious way of getting towards climate neutrality. And the next and final important part is that we need to find a way of linking the regulation for fuels with the regulation for vehicles. 
because we can see we can get to climate neutrality in vehicles with a role for an internal combustion engine. But if the carbon in that test is not recognized as being biogenic carbon, then it's denying a technology route to car makers and customers for something that scientifically would be climate neutral. And we think that needs to be corrected. And the last thing I'll say here is we can't do this alone. We need multiple stakeholders to help us design the regulations so that it works for the fuels producer, the vehicles producer, and of course the customer, whether that's an individual citizen or whether that's a business because everybody needs climate solutions and we'll only do it if we collaborate to make them work. The automotive sector is, of course, many different parts. There's passenger cars, light vans, heavy duty, and then there's also uh, maritime and aviation. They are all very interested in the work that we do. There is an active debate about what role low carbon liquids takes for passenger cars and also heavy duty vehicles. We believe road transport is a critical lead market for low carbon liquid fuels because we've already got a lot of the regulation there. But we also need to then move on and get instruments that work for aviation and maritime. The automotive industry, we are deeply uh, engaged in discussion to try and work out methodologies to make a contribution from fuels and a contribution from vehicles work together and be recognized together while having the appropriate differentiated responsibilities. Secondo lei i decisori politici hanno colto il ruolo dei nuovi carburanti nel processo verso la decarbonizzazione dei trasporti? They understand low carbon liquid fuels and I think we've had very warm reception actually for the pathway that we've described. I should be clear that there's some questioning over where these low carbon liquid fuels go. And I think it's also fair to say that there's really a strong consensus that aviation and some maritime need low carbon liquid fuels for the future. The energy density needed in particular in aviation means that the role for either electricity or perhaps hydrogen is going to be challenging. And uh, the fact that many aircraft are older Uh, but can be transitioned to climate neutrality with a, a low carbon liquid fuel, it's very attractive. The questioning comes more about what's the right role for road transport. And we've got a clear answer to that. And it goes like this, actually, that of course we agree that aviation and maritime should get these uh, liquid fuels. But we also have to be realistic about how we support the investments. The markets for fuel for aviation and maritime are global markets. The players are globally competitive. And we will require strong instruments with strong price signals to enable us to make these investments. It's difficult to see at the moment how aviation and maritime companies can make 10-year commitments to have offtake for low-carbon liquid fuels because they have to be competitive globally. We need time to develop those instruments in Europe. And we're absolutely committed to work with the Commission and those industries to help develop those policies. But there's a question for us. How fast do you want to go? How fast do you want us to go in developing those liquid fuels to get ready for the future where they are available at wide scale for aviation and maritime? We think road transport plays a critical lead role. We have the policy instruments mostly ready Already the instruments we have are capable of delivering strong price signals. With some evolution of those, we can create significant support and demand for low carbon liquid fuels that will enable us to build the technologies faster at greater scale. And that is to the benefit of not, not only aviation and maritime, but of course to the users of road transport in, in the short and medium term, giving them more technology options. And then also helping us to develop that industrial collaboration that helps the wider industrial strategy for Europe. The first thing I'd say is, here's an observation that gradually we have all adopted a mental model that decarbonization of transport is achieved by replacing the fleet, one vehicle at a time, with a zero emission vehicle. 
The first thing we would say is that actually, that actually is not the only way to achieve climate neutrality in transport. Changing the energy to climate neutral energy by 2050 would also achieve the same. And we've shown that that's possible with some volumes of liquids, as well as with electricity and with hydrogen. By the way, our strategy, our proposals are intended to be complementary to those strategies for electrification and hydrogen in transport. But we do challenge that model of replacing the fleet one vehicle at a time, because we can also see that a slightly different definition could work very well as well. An internal combustion engine vehicle, if it is powered with climate neutral fuel, could also be described as a climate neutral vehicle. And we think that policy could also enable that in the medium term. Meaning that instead of describing this action as a ban on internal combustion engine vehicles, it could be described as a ban on new vehicles that cause the emission of fossil carbon. There's nothing wrong with emitting carbon if it's circular carbon, biogenic or waste recovered carbon. Our technologies show exactly how that can be done at real scale. It will take some collaborative work to come up with a methodology to make that work in European policy, but we absolutely think that is within reach and we've already started tabling some ideas to the Commission and other stakeholders as to how that can be achieved. And I'd like to offer my thanks again to Claudio and uh, Unione Petrolifera for the opportunity. It's really important to share and to co continue our collaboration. Uh, I wish you all the best for the rest of your General Assembly and I hope to see you all again next year.